In this video, we'll demonstrate how to upgrade a non-FTS fixed sight rods by replacing the sensors and the data logger with new FTS components. There are several advantages of upgrading older equipment to FTS equipment. It eliminates obsolescence, ensuring future reliability. Aging equipment fails more frequently, so there's more chance of downtime. Downtime means loss of data. Your ROS will meet the 2013 NFDRS compliance standards. Older stations with a low data rate ghost transmitter won't. You eliminate the need for bringing a laptop to the site. One of the many advantages of the state-of-the-art data logger like the Axiom F6 is that you can do any tasks you need, like graphing sensor data, profiling battery performance, changing the annual rain count in any weather without needing a laptop. You get access to training. FTS provides on-site training on any aspect of your station, from performing annual maintenance to diving into the more obscure functions of the Axiom F6. And we do lots of it. You'll need about 45 minutes to an hour on-site to complete an upgrade on your stations. Let's get started. Before leaving for the site, note the ghost transmission time. You want to make sure that the work done on the data logger, which will disable the ghost transmissions for a period of time, will not coincide with the scheduled transmission time. If you do end up missing a transmission, don't panic, but try not to miss the 1300 hour transmission, which is the most critical. You also want to note the current accumulated rainfall value, so you can enter it into the new data logger. The tools you'll need on site are a 9 16 inch socket wrench, wire cutters, adjustable pliers, wire strippers, a hex wrench or allen key 3 8 inch, an adjustable wrench, small bubble level, a number 2 Phillips screwdriver, a utility knife, a package of self amalgamating tape, a nut driver is handy but optional, some lithium grease for lubricating all the bolts. Make sure you confirm the equipment you'll be installing against the packing list and make sure that nothing is damaged before you head out to the site. Once you get to the site, you can unpack the equipment. If you're nearing the scheduled ghost transmission, allow the station to complete the transmission before disconnecting any sensors so that you can minimize any transmissions with missing data. The ideal scenario for installation involves two people working as a team splitting the tasks. The first person removes the old data logger and old sensors and begins installation of the new sensors. Meanwhile, the second person can get the equipment enclosure ready, mount it on the tri -Lake tower, and install the electronic components inside it. The GPS antenna, the new Axiom F6 G5 data logger, and the battery. Then they can upgrade the solar panel. Once they're done, they can then assist the first person to finish installing the sensors. Unscrew the sensor cables from the old data logger. Remember that once disconnected, data will not be transmitted again until the new data logger is installed. So ideally, you would do this shortly after your scheduled transmit time, giving you an hour to get the new one in place. Remove the bolts securing the old enclosure to the support bars. It's a good idea to disconnect the negative battery terminal inside before taking off the old enclosure with the data logger. Lift the old enclosure off the tower and put it aside. Then unscrew the nuts from the U-bolts that secure the support bars to the tower and remove the support bars. Next we're going to remove all the cables and sensors. After this, the rods will be essentially bare. First remove all the cable ties. Then unscrew the cable from the Yagi antenna because it will stay unless it needs to be replaced. But don't remove the antenna unless you have a compass to position a new one properly. Make sure all tines are not damaged and that they're tight and straight not straighten any bent ones as they will break. Instead, document it and replace the antenna next service visit. The solar panel will also likely remain, so the cable must be detached from it. 
Unscrew the two screws holding the back plastic panel on, then very carefully remove the pan. Unscrew the knurled nut from the metal fitting so the cable can slide out. Once you have access to the inside, use wire cutters to cut the two leads. Leave them in place for now as it will help you to easily determine which is positive and which is negative later. Use pliers to pull out the rubber moisture blocker, then pull out the cable keeping the fittings for later use with the new cable. Now it's time to remove all the sensors, at least the ones you can get to. We'll drop the mast and deal with the ones on top in a moment. You can leave the cables attached and remove it as one piece if that's easier. Remove the fuel stick if there is one, the temperature humidity sensor, tipping bucket, and solar radiation sensor. Any mounting arms or brackets also get removed. Now it's time to drop the mast. Unscrew the bolt securing it in the upright position, then slowly lower it. The tether will keep it in a horizontal position. If there's no tether, you can use the shipping boxes to hold it such that you can service the sensors. Go ahead and remove all the remaining cable ties. Unscrew the connectors from the wind sensors. Use an Allen key to undo the screws securing the sensors to the cross arm. Finally, remove the screws securing the cross arm and lift it off. The cable for the wind sensors runs up the center of the mast too, so we'll need to detach the mast in order to pull out the cable. The new cable will just be attached to the outside of the mast for easier replacement in the future. Congratulations. At this point, you should have a naked tower ready to be upgraded with a full set of FTS equipment. Before we mount it on the tower, the equipment enclosure needs a bit of assembly. Take it out of the box and place it on its side on top of the box. This allows you to keep the door open to get access to the back of the inside. We're going to attach the hanging rods onto the back of the enclosure. You'll find the nuts and bolts taped inside one of the rods. The hooks will go at the top of the enclosure. It will allow it to hang on the top rail of the tower. The U-bolts secure the enclosure to the bottom rail of the tower. The hanging rods mount with the hooks on the outside, using the four holes at the outside corners of the enclosure. 
inside locate the four holes that match the holes we saw on the outside. Two of them are behind the keyway plate, which is what supports the data lock. You want to push the bolt through this hole and hold it, being careful not to drop it behind the keyway plate. It helps to have an assistant thread the nut on the other side while you hold it, but if you're careful, one person can do it. Place the washer, then the lock washer over the end of the bolt before the nut. Then tighten it up, hand tight. Repeat on the other end. Continue with the second hanging rod. Finally, tighten everything up. Next, attach the plastic cable elbow to the side of the enclosure. Now attach the GPS antenna to the top of the enclosure. Inside the box, you'll find the antenna itself and a small adhesive tab and small cable ties to secure the coiled up cable out of the way. It's important not to cut the cable or change its length in any way. Remove the nut and lock washer from the GPS antenna, then feed the cable through the hole on the top of the enclosure. Feed the lock washer and the nut up the length of the cable towards the hole. Put the threaded end of the antenna into the hole and thread the nut on. Coil up the cable, leaving the last 12 inches uncoiled. Attach the self-adhesive harness to the side of the enclosure. Feed the cable tie through the loops of the harness and tighten the cable around the coiled up cable. Now that the enclosure is assembled, you can mount it on the tower. Over the ends of the U-bolt, place the flat washer, a washer, then a lock washer, then the nut. On this and all other bolts, use a good dab of lithium grease to prevent corrosion. It's now time to install the electronics and get it powered up. First, mount the Axiom data logger in the enclosure. The four stainless steel pegs on the back simply fit into the holes on the aluminum keyway plate. Line them up, push it in, then let it drop. It will hold securely. Then you can connect the GPS antenna cable. You also want to connect the green ground cable which is connected to the keyway plate. Next, place the 12 volt battery on the bottom shelf of the enclosure. Attach the carrying handle that comes in the top of the box. Remove the battery terminal screws, feed the battery cable through the opening behind the upper shelf, then attach the cable ends to the battery terminals with the screws. Make sure that the temperature sensor is attached to the top of the battery. Finally, connect the battery cable to the data logger. This is a keyed bayonet connector providing a watertight seal. Twist the connector until it positively engages and you feel it slide in, then push and turn the outer ring until it clicks. At this point, the Axiom will automatically power on and obtain a GPS fix. Next, we need to connect the GOES antenna. The new cable simply screws onto the fitting connected to the antenna. Remove the foam insert temporarily and feed the cable through the plastic elbow, then screw in the cable. Screw the cable into the appropriate port on the data lock. Tightly wrap self-amalgamating tape around the connection between the cable and the antenna to keep all moisture out.
Roz has everything needed to complete the next hourly GOES transmission, even if there's no data to transmit because the sensors aren't yet installed. If the transmission happens before you complete the upgrade, you can call into NIFSI or FTS and confirm that the transmission happened without error, giving you a chance to correct the error while you're still on site, instead of waiting another hour for the next transmission. Let's connect the solar power cable. Feed the end with the two leads into the plastic box in the back of the solar panel, and using a Phillips screwdriver, screw down the leads to the appropriate terminals. Because you cut the old cable leaving the old leads on, you know exactly where the new leads go. Then replace the plastic cover. Feed the other end of the cable into the enclosure and plug it into the data logger. Now it's time to install our sensors. We'll start at the top of the mast and work our way down. Insert sensor mount into the top of the mast section. Align bolt holes, insert bolts, and tighten. Slide the orientation ring onto the mount. Ensure the key on the ring points perfectly upwards and snug the hose clamp. Slide the north arrow onto the mount as indicated and ensure that the key lines up with the notch in the north arrow. Raise the mast and using compass, ensure that the arrow points to true north. If necessary, repeat and adjust appropriately. After orientation is complete, tighten hose clamp and remove the north arrow. Install the propeller on the shaft with the serial number facing into the wind and secure with the provided plastic nut. Slide the sensor onto the mount and align the notch at the base of the sensor with the orientation ring key. Tighten the sensor's hose clamp. Secure the cable to the mast about every 12 inches with cable ties. Sure you leave some slack where the mast connects to the frame to allow the cable easy movement without being pinched when the mast is raised. Continue to strap the cables along the bottom rail of the frame, then into the enclosure and attach to the data log. Finally, you can raise the mast and secure it with the bolt you removed earlier. Use ample lithium grease. Some sensors are mounted on the arms that are connected to the frame. These arms come with U-bolts for attaching to a standard FTS tri-light tower, but they are too small for using with non-FTS towers, so locate an alternative set of U-bolts in the bag marked Miscellaneous Kit. Take two sensor arms and insert the U-bolts. Then thread the washer, lock washer, and nut combination on each end. Leave them loose. Place the two sensor arms, one for the solar radiation sensor and one for the temperature humidity sensor, on top of the post that the GOES Yagi antenna is mounted to. Lubricate these with lithium grease, then hand tighten the nuts. The arms should be perpendicular to each other. Make sure they're level, then tighten the nuts. The solar radiation sensor, called the SDI PYR, attaches to the topmost arm so as not to get shadowed by the temperature humidity sensor. THS-3 attaches to the other arm in much the same way. Again, use lithium grease for each bolt. Secure the cables to the arms, down the diagonal post and into the enclosure. Connect to the data logger.
solar radiation sensor connects to either of the orange SDI ports. Next is the tipping bucket rain gauge. Use the U-bolt to secure the mounting arm in a vertical position on one of the frame's top rails. Place the peg protruding from the tipping bucket base into the slot on the vertical arm. Use the built-in bubble level to ensure that the base is perfectly level, then tighten up the two bolts with an Allen key. One bolt allows up and down tilt movement, the other allows side-to-side -side rotation. Leave the bucket off for now, as we'll test the sensor first. If your ROS has a fuel stick, install the mounting arm for it with another U-bolt, positioning the arm pointing down diagonally so that the end is 12 inches from the ground. The fuel stick itself attaches to the arm with a hose clamp. Be very careful not to touch the wooden dowel with your fingers, as oils left behind can foul the sensor. Clean up all the cables. Ensure that they're all secured to the frame with cable ties. They should all be tied together neatly where they enter the plastic elbow. Replace the foam insert and use self-amalgamating tape to secure it and minimize entry by wasps and other crawling critters. Trim the excess off all cable ties if you haven't already done so. In this final phase, we're going to work exclusively with the Axiom Data Logger. You'll interact with the Axiom through the integrated touch screen. No need for a laptop whatsoever. We'll also take an automatically generated electronic site visit report with us on a standard USB memory stick. The first thing we'll do is test the tipping bucket. From the home screen, tap the sensors button. On the sensors screen, tap RNIN which represents the rain gauge. This screen shows you the current accumulated precipitation value in inches. Yours will most likely read zero inches. Now let's make sure that the data logger is reading tips properly. Go over to the rain gauge and carefully count five tips. You can now place the cover on the rain gauge. Back at the data logger, make sure that the reading is now 0 0.05 inches, 0 0.1 inch per tip. Assuming it's fine, set the rain value to be what the reading was in the old data logger. This is the value you recorded at the beginning. Tap set, then use the on-screen keyboard to enter the value, and tap OK. Now let's verify the annual reset date, tap setup. On this setup screen, make sure that auto reset is checked. To the right of the checkbox is the date that the accumulated rainfall value will reset back to zero. By default, it will be January 1st. If the date shown is not the date that you want, tap the edit button, which enables all controls to be changed, then tap the arrow beside the current date and select the date you want with the on-screen calendar. Press OK and you're done. Now let's validate the proper functioning of all the sensors. Tap the home button to return to the home screen. From there, tap Current Condition. You will see a list of readings acquired from all of the currently connected sensors. You'll want to make sure that none show an error, indicating a problem acquiring a measurement. If you do see this, the first thing to check is that you have properly connected all cables to the data logger and on the other end to the sensor. Assuming that there are no errors, just make sure the readings you see seem correct. Tap Home to return to the home screen. Next, let's validate the GOES transmission, which should have occurred at this point. From the home screen, tap Telemetry. 
From the main telemetry screen, tap the status button for port A, which is used for the G5 GOES transmitter integrated into the Axiom data logger. Now is a good time to make note of your GOES transmission time. It should be identical to the time used by the old data logger that you noted before you came out to the site, unless you have upgraded a low data rate transmitter, in which case it will be different. Find the transmission time in the middle of the screen. In this example, it happens at 11 minutes, 11 seconds past the hour. You should find the program transmit time printed on the orange tag attached to the outside of the data logger. If the data logger was installed and powered up when the last GOES transmission occurred, then you can validate the transmission. Otherwise, let enough time lapse for the transmission to occur. You may want to proceed with entering the sensor serial numbers and then return. If a GOES transmission has happened, then tap TX Log to view the transmit log. If there's a record in the log, you know a successful transmission has occurred. The log will also allow you to verify that your GOES antenna is connected properly. Take a look at the forward and reflected power ratings. The reflected power should be about half the forward power. If everything looks good, you know that the station is transmitting properly. But before you leave the site, it's a good idea to verify that the antenna is aligned properly and that the signal is being received and the data is getting through. To do this, just call either FTS or the Interagency Fire Center and confirm that your transmission was received and that the data looks good. If you call the Interagency Fire Center, you can at any time confirm with the ROS Help Desk that you've activated the station and upgraded the logger. This is an important step to ensure continued access to NES IDs. If you don't do it while on site, then it can be done once you've left the site. Let's review. Before you leave the site, call to confirm the data transmission was received. Call either FTS or NIFSI. If you contact NIFSI, you can at the same time inform them that your station has been activated with the new data logger. Otherwise, you can do this after you leave the site. Tap Home to return to the home screen. Finally, we're going to enter all of the new sensor serial numbers into the data logger and have it generate an electronic site visit report. The site visit report will be created and saved on your USB memory stick, so insert it into either of the USB ports labeled USB Host. On the home screen, tap Service. On the service screen, tap Visit Report. Enter your name in the technician field using the on-screen keyboard. Start the report creation by tapping Start Visit. Tap OK. Tap Back to return to the Services screen. Then tap Serial Number Table. A list of all sensors appears in a table. Beginning with the rain gauge, tap the name of the sensor in the red box and enter the serial number which you find on the label on each sensor. The solar radiation sensor, labeled SDI PYR, is unique and can automatically determine its own serial number since it is a digital sensor. Instead of entering a serial number, just tap Auto Detect and it will be entered for you. When you've finished entering all of the serial numbers, we'll complete the site visit report. Tap Back to return to the service screen. Tap Visit Report again and then finally, end visit. The full site visit report will be shown on screen, including all of the serial numbers that you've just entered. It will also be saved to the USB memory stick, which you can now remove. Congratulations! Your station has been given a new lease on life with the most rugged and reliable equipment available, and we're certain you'll come to absolutely adore the simplicity of the state-of-the-art Axiom data logger with future site visits. We offer unlimited telephone support for the lifetime of your FTS products. Contact us if you have any questions at 1-800-548-4264 or through our website at www.ftsfireweather.com.